Let's pray again. Oh Lord, we, we're so grateful that uh, the time that we celebrate Your resurrection is not just one Sunday a year. That's every Sunday. And it's every day of our lives. Because we live and serve a risen Savior. Or Jesus, the fact that You truly humbled Yourself to, to die in our place on that cross is more than I can truly comprehend. That You would humble Yourself in that way to, be, to, to, to die in our place, to be buried in a grave, but then to conquer sin and death once and for all by Your resurrection. Thank You. Thank You, God. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Holy Spirit. We serve a risen Savior. We are, we're not just doing this out of a religious act or some obligation to some religion. But we gather in this place because of who You are and what You have done for us and the hope of eternal life in You and because of our desire to follow You and to serve You here in this life. And so we gather here and we humble ourselves before You I humble myself before you as we enter this time of your message and uh, from your word and pray that what you would have to be said would be said and that your Holy Spirit would, would take this simple message and, and convict every heart, speak to every heart and every person in this place today. Um, I can't do that. The Holy Spirit, you can. And so I give myself to you and trust you with this time. And I pray in Christ's name. Amen. You know, sometimes it's time for people to grow up. And some of us do that. Some of us not so well. But here's how you know when you're grown up. You're not a kid anymore. Okay, You're not a kid anymore when you consider coffee one of the most important things in life. Some of you aren't there yet. You're not a kid anymore when you quit trying to hold your stomach in no matter who walks in the room. You're not trying to press anybody anymore. It's too late. You're not a kid anymore when you actually enjoy watching the news. You're not a kid anymore when the only reason you're still awake at 4 a.m. is indigestion. You're not a kid anymore when you're proud of your lawnmower. You're not a kid anymore when you really do want a new washing machine for your birthday. You're not a kid anymore when you no longer think that speed limits are a challenge. And finally, you're not a kid anymore when 7 a.m. is your idea of sleeping in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some of you are there yet, some of you aren't. You know, in the book of Galatians, Paul has been talking about uh, to us something about the things that are no longer uh, a part of us in our life. He, he, the, the church at Galatia, the churches in Galatia had received the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ when Paul went through there. He established some churches and they began a ministry there. And Paul left and went back, but some people came in behind him and began to preach a different message. If you really want to know Jesus the Messiah, you need to follow uh, the law. And if you really want to be saved, you've got to accept the, the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision. And so they were saying, this is what you have to do really to be saved. And as you know, those of you who've been with us, Paul wrote this letter in response to that to say, wait a minute. We're not bound by the law anymore. We're not saved by a system of do's and don'ts. We're not saved by some sort of religious act. And Paul's going to speak to that issue of circumcision more specifically later. And he gets very graphic about it. But he says, uh, he says these are not the things that save us. And last week we saw he, he brought in the argument of experience. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit by doing a bunch of things? 
Or did you receive it by faith? Simply believing in the message that you heard. Which is it? Well, the answer was obvious. They, they received the Holy Spirit by faith, not, not by obeying a system of do's and don'ts. And, and Paul continues to argue this point because he wants to make it very clear. See, we, we as people sometimes, um, we come to Christ in faith, but, but then we, we sometimes get in this system of living by some sort of legalism. Some sort of system whereby we can try to measure our own spirituality by what we do or measure somebody else's spirituality by what we do. And, and so when Paul addresses the law and these principles of the law, as I said last week, most of us are not tempted to go back and obey all the 600 and something Old Testament laws. But sometimes we're tempted to put ourselves back under some system of legalism rather than living by the Spirit of God, living by faith in the Spirit of and in what God is doing in our lives. And so Paul wants to emphasize this a little bit more. And so he's talking about this again. If you pick up your Bibles, we're in Galatians chapter 3, and we're in, in verse 15. Now he just got through saying that Jesus Christ became a curse for us. He said anyone who wants to live by the law is under a curse because if you live under the law, you're required to obey it all. And if you don't obey it all, you fall under the curse of the law. And that's why we don't need the law, because no one can be perfect. No one can obey it all. And so, but Jesus Christ came to be that curse for us to free us from the law and legalism. And so he got through arguing that point last week. We, we received the Spirit. But in verse 15, he says, brothers. Okay, Paul finally uses a term of endearment. He's blasted these people so far. Previously, he called them, you foolish Galatians! He's going to calm down just a little bit. And he calls them brothers. They're probably going, Whew. Maybe, maybe he's not going to get too hard on us here, but he says brothers. Let me take an example from everyday life. Now, just as no one can set aside and add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. There were certain covenants that couldn't be broken, human covenants. You established them, they were kind of bound by law. So if, what he means by duly established, if it was a covenant between people, that, that it, couldn't, it couldn't be broken. That's what he's talking about there. He says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God, and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on promise. But God in His grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Now, Paul uh, appealed to Abraham last time and said, now remember Abraham, so Abraham was the first of the patriarchs, considered the first of the, of the nation of Israel, uh, uh, the first of the Jewish people. Israel was... Uh, Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob was later renamed Israel, and his 12 sons became the foundation of what we call the nation of Israel. But, they go, but the patriarchs went all the way back to Abraham because Abraham was the beginning of all this. And so he referred to Abraham last time we saw, saying that Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. But now he's going to appeal to Abraham again. He said, okay, if you want to start the beginning of this thing, let's look at Abraham. Let's go back to the promise God gave Abraham. Here's a passage you should know about the Old Testament. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. It's, it's an important passage because there's a big transition that happens right here in, in Genesis chapter 12. You see, the first 11 chapters of Genesis deal with approximately 2,000 years of history. Approximately 2,000 years of history occur in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. From Genesis 12 to the end of the Old Testament is God's dealing with His, His people, the nation of Israel. And there's something going on here. God is emphasizing this relationship with His chosen people. And so chapter 12 begins this. In chapter 12, verse 1, we read this. Now the Lord said to Abram, now this is Abraham. Later God changed His name to Abraham. But in the beginning His name was Abram. Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who, who bless you, 
and will uh, and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and the next two verses say that so Abram got up and did what the Lord said and took off now you find out Abram was a very rich guy he had lots of possessions he had lots of animals he had servants he had all these this clan of people and, and he, he traveled with his father and his father's clan. But he separates himself from all them and then goes to where God tells him to go. But Paul, the point Paul is making is it began, all this began with a promise. It did not begin with law. It did not begin with Abram's obedience. It began with God's promise to Abraham. Abraham responded in faith by doing what God asked, but it started with a promise. And so Paul is going all the way back to this portion of the Old Testament and saying, look, everything began with this promise. God's promise. If you're talking about the Jewish people and the nation of Israel and the law, all this came before the law. Before the law ever existed, some 430 years before the law came along, the people of Israel living by a promise. There was no law. Do you realize there was no law for the first some 2,500 years of history that we know of, there was no law. See, we think all the Old Testament, all past was about law. But the law came later. He's going to tell us more about why the law was given. But Paul is appealing here. Let's go back to the promise. The promise was, he says, by God's grace. Not by works, not by obedience. Not by law. The promise came according to God's grace. And God chose Abram according to grace. Not because of who he was or what he did. There's no history of Abram doing really anything special for God. God just said, okay, I've chose you. I want to show you grace. And I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And I'm going to so protect you that anybody that tries to curse you, I will curse them. And anyone who blesses you, I will bless them. And then through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And Paul appeals to this and says that it was, it was, it was Abram's descendant, singular, speaking of Christ, through whom the promise would be, come into effect. That it was Jesus who would come and bring that promise that all the world, all the nations of the world, anybody on the face of the earth can come into a relationship with God simply through faith in Jesus Christ. And so this all began, all the Jewish people begin with a promise, not with law. And so he's making this appeal to the people. And so he, we see that it was basically God's grace and His love that brought this about. And even though you know, God's people sinned and rebelled through all these years of history, it was still God referred back to that that promise, that promise that he gave. So we, we see that human beings really have been sinful all their life. P prior, to the, prior to God pulling out Abraham, prior to the law that was sin in the world. Genesis 6 talks about how God was grieved in his heart because mankind was so sinful. And that's when the flood came. When God created mankind, he didn't give mankind a lot of laws. There was basically the idea they should love and worship God. We find, you can find that in the Old Testament. There's a basic idea you, you should respect other people. Remember Cain and Abel? Um, Cain killed Abel and, and God marked him and said, you know, this is a wrong thing to do. You don't harm other people. And the concept of loving God and loving other people we find in those first 11 chapters of the Old Testament. But there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of law, not a lot of do's and don'ts. God let people live according to how they wanted to. And that resulted in mankind becoming sinful. God judges the world with a flood. And what happens? They don't change. Mankind doesn't change. Here in a recent poll by Barna, this past summer, August 2016, um, the, the results, he asked questions about morality. And here's some of the questions he asked and the response that he got to that or not really a question, a statement. He would give this statement and see how people responded. And there was a, you know, the majority, he, he, he uh, you know, we interviewed all these people, thousands of people, some who claimed to be Christians, some who didn't, just adults. So he has statistics for all adults. He has 
statistics for those who claim to be Christians. So the first statement is, the best way to find yourself is to look within yourself. The best way to find yourself is to look within yourself. 91% of, of United States adults agreed and 76% of professing Christians believe. It's not looking to God, it's looking to yourself. It tells something about our, our society. Here's the next statement. People should not criticize someone else's lifestyle choices. 89% of people agreed and 76% of Christians agree. Whatever you choose to do is your business. We don't have anything to do with that. That's, that's the, the attitude of our culture. To, to be fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things your heart desires most. Right? That's what we're told to do. Whatever your heart tells you to do, do that. 86% of people, adults agreed and 72% of Christians agree. That's okay if those desires are guided by God, but if they're not, what are they guided by? The sinful nature. The highest goal in life is to enjoy it as much as possible. In other words, have all the fun you can possibly get. Right? 84% agreed, 66% of Christians agreed. One last statement. Any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. Any kind of sexual expression. 69% agreed and 40% of Christians agreed. Based on the results, this is the conclusion. The morality of self-fulfillment is everywhere. Like the air we breathe, much of the time we don't even notice we're constantly bombarded with the messages that reinforce self-fulfillment. Mankind tends toward this. We tend toward what I want, what I like, what fulfills me, what makes me happiest. Whatever makes me happiest at the moment. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says or anybody else does, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to find fulfillment in me, I'm going to be happy with me, and it doesn't matter what anybody else says or does. It doesn't matter how it affects anybody else. It's just, it's about me. And that's, that's the tendency. When we can become so self-absorbed and so self-focused, mankind is always going to tend toward more and more immorality. It, it's just, it's happened since the beginning of time. And it continues to happen today. So God... When he selected Abraham, and then he chose the, the, the nation of the, the children of Israel, they go into slavery for about 400 years. God delivers them out. Now here's these people who have no concept of right and wrong. They live in their slavery of the, against the, you know, with the Egyptians. They have really no concept of right and wrong. So God says, now you're my people. You're my chosen people that I want you to represent me in the world. That was, that was the purpose of the nation of Israel was to represent God in the world. So that when people looked at them, they saw a people who stood out among everybody else, who worshipped God, who, who, who worshipped in awe of this Almighty God, and his, this God was reflected in the way they lived and walked and, and breathed. And people were to see that and be attracted to that. The concept of a city on a hill, the light on a hill. They were to be attracted to this this group of people that set themselves apart from the rest of the world. And so God gave them some guidelines to go by. It was the law. And the people said, whatever you say, God, we will do. But of course they didn't. And that's why God instituted the sacrificial system. The sacrificial system came along because they would constantly fail at keeping the law, so they had to bring the blood sacrifices so that something had to die in order for them to receive forgiveness of sin. And they brought it over and over again. So here Paul talks about, the, back in Galatians, if you want to turn back there, to, to the reason, some of the reasons God gave the law. We say, you know, sometimes we say today, well, why? Why did God give the law if we don't live by the law today? There he says, 19. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. 
And a mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. The mediator he's talking about was Moses. Moses was the one who put it into effect. Here he says it was added because of sin. Because there was so much sin in the world. Because these, this, these people who just had come out of slavery had no idea really of right and wrong. They, were, they had been subjected to the Egyptian culture. And now they needed something to know right and wrong. So the law was put in effect because of sin so people would know right and wrong. So that was one of the reasons the law had been given. Was so that because there was sin in the world. It showed them what right and wrong was. But it also showed them that they were sinful people. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Paul says the law was given so that sin would, sin would abound. Because when sin abounds, then grace abounds. In other words, it was the knowledge of sin. Sin's going to abound anyway. But what happens when somebody tells you, don't do this? You cannot touch the wet paint. There's something within us. When somebody says, don't do it, we just, we just want to. It makes us want to. It stirs up sin to say, I don't, don't do this. When your parents say, don't stay out past 10 o'clock. How about 10.01? Or 10.02? Can I switch it to you know, 10.05? Or... You know, we want to push that limit. Something says, I don't want to abide by the law. I want, I want some leeway there. And so when the law came, it just really showed them how sinful they already really were. Because they couldn't obey it all. And so the law was added because of sin. But you see, the law we've already seen could not give life. Paul said in chapter 2, if there was any law on the face of the earth that could give life, it would have been by the Old Testament law. But the law can't give life. The law can't bring change. The law can't change your heart. It can't change your mind. It can't change the way you act. It's just law. Law doesn't change us. The law couldn't change. There was this guy in Massachusetts who was up late at night. He was hungry. Probably stayed up all night at a party or something. I don't know. But he drove up to Taco Bell at 1.30 in the morning. The Taco Bell is closed. There were some people still inside cleaning. And he drives up to the drive through window and nobody comes. So he starts honking his horn. And he honks and he honks and he honks for about two minutes. He's honking his horn trying to get somebody to come to the window. So finally one of the guys in the window, inside comes and opens the window and says, Sir, we're closed. We're locked up. We put away all our cooking equipment. I'm, I'm sorry, we're closed now. And the guy says, Man, I just want some tacos. He says, I'm sorry, we're closed. You can come back tomorrow and get tacos. And the guy got so mad... He, he floored the accelerator on his car, sped off. He went straight through, hit the side of the building, and ran into an ATM, crashed his car. He got so angry because he couldn't get tacos. Knocked himself unconscious. He said the police came and, and arrested him, and he was eventually you know, uh, let out on a $500 bail. But here's the point. You know, we can get so angry about something as simple as not having tacos. Then we crash our car. Maybe you wouldn't do that. But law cannot control that kind of anger. If you tell him, don't do that, what's he going to do? He's going to go do it. Law cannot control the sinful nature. Law is, is not able to bring that. That's why Christ had to come. God allowed people to live by however you want to live. And man sinned. God said, okay, here's a law. Obey this law. Man sinned. And finally Jesus came and said, okay, I'm going to take care of the problem. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of sin once and for all. I'm going to pay the burden for sin. When I came, when I come into the world. And that's what Jesus Christ did. And Paul goes on to talk about further purpose of the law. He says, is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? No. The law is not opposed to the promises of God. Absolutely not. If there had been a law given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. If you could obey a bunch of rules and get saved, 
then the law is the way. If you want to be saved by law, go back and read all the Old Testament laws and obey all of them. Then you can get saved, right? Not even the Old Testament law. Law cannot give life. Law does not redeem. Law cannot change our heart. He says, if there had been a way, it would have been the Old Testament law. But the Scripture declares that the whole world is, in, is a prisoner to sin um, <clears throat> so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith and now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. He said, the law led people to Christ. How? They couldn't obey it all. They were sinful people. They couldn't do it all. So they had this sacrificial system that said, there must be bloodshed. An animal must die. Something must die in order for you to receive atonement and forgiveness for your sin. And in those sacrifices, what God intended was that when they brought that sacrifice, they were confessing their sin. And they were trusting God that in His grace, through the death of this animal, they would receive forgiveness. But yet they had to do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. Ultimately, it was to lead them to say, we must have a perfect sacrifice and that sacrifice is the Lamb of God. Isaiah revealed this, this suffering servant who would come and take away the sin and bear the sin of the world. And so all those sacrifices were to lead them to say, we need a better sacrifice. And that would be Messiah. That would be the Lamb of God. And as John said, He came to take away the sin of the world. How many of you are happy? Holly Elmore wrote a fascinating article about faking that she was happy on Facebook and how that actually helped her. She said she went on to, uh, every time she got on Facebook, she would post the good things that were happening in her life. Even though she was quite depressed and discouraged, you know, she, she graduated from school and she got married and she went on and got a PhD and had some kids. All these things were supposed to be good. You know, you post those things on Facebook and there's nothing wrong with that. But she had to do these things to try to convince herself that she was truly happy. Because at the heart, in reality, she was quite discouraged and depressed. And so to get over her depression, she would post things on Facebook. But what happens when you don't have something good that happens? What happens when you don't have something to paste? Post on Facebook. Paste, whatever. Post, paste, whatever. You're, somebody, was listen, somebody was actually listening. <laughs> I mean, there has to be something deeper within us that, that resolves those difficult times in life. Just posting something on Facebook is only temporary. And it may depend on how many likes you get on that too, right? You post something happy and you only get two likes, that's not, that's not very happy. You, know, you want a bunch of likes to make you feel good about what you posted. See, we're so dependent on these type of things, and yet Christ came to give us life. So we don't have to depend upon what we post on Facebook in order to, to find joy, to find happiness, to find fulfillment. There's nothing wrong with Facebook. If you're on Facebook, that's fine. I'm Facebook friends with a lot of you. And I get on there occasionally to find out what you're doing, but not all the time. But it's okay. Okay. I post things every now and then on Facebook. When you, guys were, when you guys were in the middle of your snowstorm here, I pasted a picture of Eva and myself with our granddaughter swimming in the swimming pool. And some of you are going, yeah, we didn't like that one very much. That's okay. But where do you find life? Where do you find fulfillment in life? You can't find that in a law. You can't find it in, in doing a bunch of do's and don'ts. Life, real life, eternal life, abundant life comes through the promise, Jesus Christ, who came to bring blessing on all people for all time, from every country, from every nation, from every ethnic group, forever and ever. 
Jesus came to bring blessing to all people. And the promise was made to Abraham before he really was a Jewish person. He was basically like the rest of us. He was a Gentile. God pulled him out of everybody else and said, I'm going to bless you. And through you, I will provide blessing for all people. And that fulfillment is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying here. The faith in Jesus Christ has done away with the law. Not the sense of right and wrong. Paul's going to talk about that later. Don't use your liberty in Christ in order to fulfill the desires of the flesh. We'll talk more about that later. But there's freedom from, a, from the obligation of a sense of, of law so that we might live by the power of the Spirit. We might live by the power of the Spirit. That's what Paul is getting to. The law has been done away with. Legalism has been destroyed. And now we live. We are saved by faith, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We live by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So that He will produce His works within us. It starts from within. The change occurs in my heart, my mind, and my soul. And through the Holy Spirit is produced as it works outward. As Jesus said, flow, a flow of uh, living water, streams of living water will flow from within you, which is the Holy Spirit. Law can't do that. Law can't produce a stream of the Holy Spirit within you. Can't do it. It's, it's, it's by faith we receive Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit. And then as we trust Him, He works His goodness out from within it's an interesting thing. You know, we saw the, how uh, in America there's a shift in morality. But there's another interesting statistic that the world as a whole is becoming more religious. Around the world, people are pursuing some type of religion. You know, I think deep within, sometimes we know when, when things aren't right. And so we pursue. But uh, an article... Uh, written, uh, it's a book written by Rodney Stark called The Triumph of Faith. He begins to talk about if you look around the world, there's this move around the world to, to all types of religions. Not just Christianity, but lots of religions. There's this, this move toward religion. See, I think deep within us, somehow we know there's something wrong. There's something broken. And though we really want to live any way we want to live, something, something tells us. There's something broken there. See, that's the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And though we as a society are going down morally, there's still something there. The Holy Spirit is still convicting sin, people of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. So people are looking for some sort of religious help, some sort of religious system, some sort of do's and don'ts that will help them uh, maybe be good enough. But you see, they all fall short. Because law and religion and legalism cannot change you. It cannot change your heart and your mind and your soul. It must come through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit within. And this is Paul's argument. This is what he's trying to get to. The answer is not religion. It's not even a religious life. It's a person. It's Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit who lives within. Where are you today, friend? I, I know many of you. Most of you here probably have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've trusted Him as your Savior. If you haven't, you're trying to be good enough to please God or please your parents or please your teachers to try to be good enough to be accepted in this world. You might reach that acceptance at some point, but you'll never reach full acceptance because we all fall short in some way. There's no system of laws, no, no system of good things that, that can make you truly feel complete and accepted. The Lord Jesus Christ accepts you right where you are. With all your faults, all your troubles, all your, your shortcomings, if you just simply come to Him in faith and trust in Him, that He died for you for your sin because He loves you so much. And He is the one who will bring change in your life. 
He is the one who will give you acceptance. He is the one who will redeem you and make you God's child. We'll talk about that more next week in the book of Galatians. If you don't know Him, maybe you've come to the realization that you need something besides a system of do's and don'ts in your life. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. It only comes through faith. Faith is the only thing. You can't walk down an aisle. You can't do a bunch of religious things. You can't put money in the plate. You can't do any of that. I have a preacher who used to once say, he said, if you thought you were getting saved by the money you put in your plate, he said, come see me and we'll give you your money back. That's a pretty good deal. If you thought you were going to be saved by what you put in these bags, it's not a plate, it's a bag. If you thought that was going to give you everlasting life, we don't want you to think that. It won't save you. Hopefully, if you put anything in there, it's because you love the Lord. Maybe because you had some money, so maybe you don't have any money. But That's okay, I understand that. Um, I'm just saying, those things that we do do not bring everlasting life. We do them because we love the Lord and what He's already done for us. If you don't know the Lord, we're going to sing a song here in a minute. A minute. I, uh, we need, I need the Lord. I need you, Lord. I think that's what it's called. I need you, right? <laughs> can't remember the name of the song. Do you need Him today? Have you trusted Him? Have you received Him in your life as, you, as your Savior and Lord? Would you consider doing that today if you don't know Him? If you do know Him, what are you trusting in for your fulfillment in life? Are you truly allowing the Holy Spirit to live in you? Or are you just trying to do a bunch of do's and don'ts? Letting the Holy Spirit flow from within to become that river of living water in the lives of other people. Are you living and walking by faith? I hope so. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you again. That we're not bound by a system of law because we fall short. There would never be a system of do's and don'ts that we will ever be able to keep perfectly. And the law has revealed that to us. We can't even keep the Ten Commandments fully and completely. Thank you, Jesus, that you were the sacrifice for us. And thank you now we live in freedom. The freedom of the grace of God that comes to us from, through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray if there's anyone here today that truly has never accepted you, has never entered into that life, I pray that you would convict their hearts right now. Draw them near by your Holy Spirit. Allow them to come to you and simply trust you for what you have already done for them. And they might receive you as their Savior and Lord right here, right now, in the service. For those of us that know you, thank you. We worship you. We praise you. We, we lift our voices to you. Help us, Lord, this week. To live by faith, to walk in faith each day, and to allow you to produce your works within us. We love you, Lord. We give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.